still do not see it there. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the U.S. Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon of February 28th, 2021. My name is Janati Stolirov II, and I'm the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. We are pleased to have today for you a discussion of longevity advocacy, of music, of culture, of how all of these aspects interrelate. And we have an esteemed panel of US Transhumanist Party officers and members. We have our Director of Applied Innovation, David Shoemaker. We have our Director of Visual Arts, Art Ramon Garcia. We have our Foreign Ambassador in Spain and Technology Advisor, Dr. Jose Cordero. We have our member Brent Elman, and as our special guest, we have Maria Entragis Abramson, who is the Global Outreach Coordinator for the Stens Research Foundation. And she is an amazing person of many talents. Today, we will talk about how she uses all of her talents to enable all of us to live longer and better in our futures. Welcome, Maria. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Janadi. And hello, everyone out there. And hello, panel. Thank you for being here. Yes, certainly. And let's begin at the beginning. So you hail from Argentina. You grew up there. Uh, could you describe some of your early experiences in Argentina and how they contributed to you becoming a supporter of longevity? Yes. Um, well, in Argentina, I have to tell you, I was the only person, at least in my circle, which was very big, um, that, that was thinking about these things, that was thinking about aging at all. Um, I really don't know what brought me to get so involved and so concerned about aging and, and started seeing it as a problem. I think um, it may have been one day that I was walking with my sister in the streets in the neighborhood and I was very, very little, probably five years old or so. And my sister is seven years old, uh, long, uh, older than me. And I saw this lady that was completely bent over and she was walking down, looking down and walking slowly and uttering, you know, in pain every step she made. And, and it impacted me, you know, to see that image. So I, I asked my sister and I said, what's wrong with her? And she said, oh, you know, she's just old. We are all going to be like that. And, and that was kind of, scary to me and then she and then she added on top she said you know we're all born dead she told me and uh i didn't know exactly what death was but i knew it was a bad thing and um since then i think i got i became very curious about aging because i it was strange to me to see that people were not questioning the same things i was questioning and to me there was no doubt that it was a bad thing and that people who were old were in pain and pain was bad, right? So I, I, I would always see how isolated they were. And then of course, as I grew older, uh, you know, I would talk to old people and they would tell me, you know, how sad they were. Or they would tell me things like, oh, you're young, you have your whole life in front of you and it's so wonderful and that's the best thing you can have. And I don't know, a, a bunch of things made me really interested in the subject and, and I was surprised that nobody was questioning it and that everyone was accepting it as this natural thing and oh yeah you know she died but, but she was old you know like it was that that was it was fine because she was old or she's very sick but she's very old and and it just didn't agree with me it just didn't agree with me and I and I couldn't talk about it with many people in Argentina where you know we always had problems that were everyday problems of, you know, not having enough of the, of the basic stuff that we need, right? Um, so I, I would just think about it by myself and then research as I could. And, and, and I got really interested in understanding the process of aging and what aging 
really was. So I started reading as much as I could in the subject. And, uh, and yeah, so in Argentina, I didn't do anything uh, in terms of advocacy. I, I left very, very young. Um, so I started thinking about this and I started uh, pondering and learning and reading as much as I could when I was a teenager and talking about it with my mom. My mom was very open-minded and she loved life and she always fantasized about living forever. And uh, so we would talk about it and, and think that the, the one day there will be a way that we, we can change uh, our finite life. And, and yeah, and then... I, I only um, got involved in the field when I was in the U.S. already, which I, I moved here in 1992. Yes, uh, and this is quite interesting because actually there are some parallels between our early lives. I also uh, was quite uh, aghast at the thought of death when I was a young child. Uh, I recall first learning about it when I was three, and I could never accept that human mortality was justified. And when I was five, I promised that I would dedicate my life to the fight against death and biological aging. And uh, like with you, adults tried to convince me that, oh, it's not so bad, or uh, you should worry about it, uh, or it's all natural, but I could never reconcile myself to that. And it, it seems like there, there are, are these kids out there who kind of like to scandalize kids who are slightly younger than they are. And when they're so nonchalant and talking about death, it's almost like they're trying to sound cool or they're trying to perhaps scare the younger child a little bit. And of course, I, I was never like that as a kid, but I knew some kids who were slightly older than I was who would try to do that to me. Uh, so there is a little bit of a parallel there, but it's interesting because you had that resiliency, you had that independence of thinking from a very early age that led you to reject mortality as something inevitable or desirable very strange at such a young age you know early age just naturally thinking that and and i don't know i don't know if it, i always think it was that moment that impacted me so much but i don't really know what it was but i, I since i remember i always thought about this and and i always thought no this is gonna change and um yeah kind of magical you know yes indeed and you did get help validation from your mother as well who yeah. uh, was able to uh, instead of just uh, dismissing your ideas uh, yeah. she encouraged them and she fostered the spirit of curiosity in you she, she did and she was she was like that about life and my father was also he also had incredible mind and he was an engineer a mechanic, mechanical engineer and he he was um, the person that I think <clears throat> brought to me the idea of nothing is impossible you, you just think about it and, and, and go and try to do it and, and you see that you're gonna be able to do it and uh, and he, uh, he, you know, we would sit down and talk about uh, perpetual motion and, you know, concepts that, that were, for, I was so young, I was maybe 10, you know, and he will, you know, draw uh, robots that he, he, will, he was designing some ro robots for the factory that he had. Um, so machines that would work on making pieces and stuff. So he, he, he had also this, this very open-minded, innovative, uh, mind and uh, and that also helped I think together with my, my mind my mom's uh, passion for life and and my father's you know more of the uh, intellectual thinker and, and, and but also very open-minded um, that's where I yeah that's what happened and then here I am <laughs> yes indeed and here we all are, and through our various paths, we have made it to the point where uh, we are devoting a lot of our time and energy to advocating for lengthening human lifespans and curing diseases. Uh, but of course, each of us has also had to overcome a lot of cultural resistance to that, that idea. We had to 
be very strong willed, we had to be independently minded in order to get to where we are. And I'm curious, what advice would you have for young people, uh, including maybe even children who might be watching this, uh, about how they could persevere if they have this desire as well to fight aging, to fight disease, how can they get to the point where we are right now and not let uh, all of the resistance and negativity that they might encounter discourage them from pursuing these goals? Yes, I went through a lot of different um, different periods about this since I started working in the field. Uh, in the beginning, I was obsessed with changing people's minds about it and, uh, and, and really, you know, making, making people uh, believe that this was the right thing and, and, and how can you not see that and how, you know, it was upsetting to me. Um, so back then I would have told every, every young person and every kid, no, you have to tell people, you know, no matter what they say, you have to make sure they understand this is so important, this is the main thing. And now recently, I don't know, I would say maybe four or five years ago, I started changing my mind to realizing that this may not be for everyone. And, and that we don't have to, we don't have to agree. Uh, not everybody has to agree with us and we don't have to have everybody on our side and it's not gonna happen like that. So I think the idea is to find, what I would tell the young people is to go out and find those who are who predisposed to, to, to see that this is a great thing and find them because they are out there and they don't know about this, but they would like it, but they need to, to hear about it. And that's what I've been doing. So I, I now, after so many years talking to so many people about this, I recognize immediately who are the, the, the people that I, I don't have to keep insisting because it, it would only be better, you know, for both of us. And it's not going to take me anywhere or them and they're going to stay in, in where they are. So the idea, yeah, is, is to talk about these ideas as much as you can in whatever type of advocacy style that you are involved with. And, uh, but, but not, I wouldn't say I don't want to be rude and say waste time, but you know, not use the time with those who are going to be against it when you realize that they just hate the idea and they don't like you for what you're doing. And I just turn, I, I mean, thank you. You know, you, you know, you can decide your, you own your life if you want to get old and you want to die. And, you know, I respect it, but I have something else to do now. <laughs> Right. Yes. Well, hopefully we can establish enough pathways for the people who are already inclined toward agreeing with us to find us and hopefully to find us at an age when they still feel the sense of optimism about the prospect, when they haven't had it kind of enculturated out of them. Uh, I do find sometimes if people in their middle years encounter the ideas of transhumanism or life extension, they kind of approach them with a greater skepticism because they've been taught in all of their preceding lives that, well, this is science fiction or there are uh, certain certain problems with these goals, according to certain figures in uh, the mainstream culture. And I, I just hope we can find enough people who are predisposed to our way of thinking early on before they lose that confidence that this is possible or this is a worthwhile fight. I also believe strongly that all those people who in the past may have told me things like what you're doing is wrong and you're playing God and this is not ethical. I am sure that if there's a pill tomorrow they can take <laughs> when they are in a lot of pain and they're very sick because of aging, uh, I think they will take it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Yes, I think so as well, uh, given that many people go in for very ambitious medical treatments when they need mm -hmm. them, like open heart yeah. surgery or say chemotherapy, which has a lot of side effects. It's very uncertain, but most people will prefer that to a certain death. And oh, yeah. I do it's think... Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I get excited with that because it's unbelievable that people don't put it together that this is exactly the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, we have spoken with Aubrey de Grey on several occasions about what will these future rejuvenation therapies be like? And he emphasized that a lot of them will be very similar in terms of their manner of delivery to uh, what patients experience today. And the hope For is- sure. mm -hmm. The hope and is- And as, as technology advances, probably a lot less invasive even. Right. So if you can take a pill uh, or maybe get uh, like an injection similar to what one gets with a vaccine and it's not that painful it's not that intrusive why wouldn't yeah. people do it i know mm -hmm. yeah it's incredible all the kinds of questions people come up with um but they they don't when it comes to any disease and when they have to go to a doctor and the doctor tells them you need to take this pill you need to do this treatment or this surgery they don't question it but if you tell them we're going to add 50 more years, you know, and it's that something happens there, right? There's this conditioning mm -hmm. to, no, no, that's not, that's crazy. That's bad. That's weird. That's scary. That's creepy. That's, I don't know. It, it, that, that's the biggest struggle with mm -hmm. all my years involved here. That's the biggest struggle. And I think that's the toughest thing that we need to overcome. And it's much bigger, much bigger than the science itself. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the pathway uh, for overcoming that kind of resistance, especially because if people are offered a specific treatment, they will often accept it, but something about the idea of life extension in general turns certain people off. On the other hand, it really intrigues other people. And if somebody told me, well, with this treatment, you could get 50 extra years, I would say, give it yeah, to me now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. And you encountered a lot of those people too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I don't have the answer, unfortunately, yet, but I think we're, we're getting closer to, to, to a lot of things, but to understanding that too. Um, I think one thing will make a difference would be when there's some therapy out there that can actually show uh, something that is not, you can't argue and it, wow, this is, you know, uh, really curing uh, one of the, one of the age related diseases, which we have not cured one of them yet. So we, we have taken care of uh, either cured or, or put under medical control a lot of the infectious diseases, but not one of the degenerative diseases that come with aging. So if tomorrow there's something that absolutely cures, you know, Alzheimer's or or cardiovascular disease, um, that it will start changing people's minds. And then when they see, oh, that brings a, a side effect, side benefit, like always says, you know, of extending my life. Okay, cool. I think people will start accepting it. Um, and of course the, something like if they see it in an animal and then that they extended the life of an animal 25 years, I think people have a hard time. I mean, 25 years, uh, you know, like 25% of the, their lifespan. I think people have a hard time, um, with things that are sudden and radical. It's very scary. You know, they just, there's, there's a blockage immediately to that stuff. Um, so I think we, for example, at SANS, um, we've changed our language a lot, the, our message. Um, and you need to understand what is not going to scare people away when you talk about this. And we've tried everything and I've seen everything since the very beginning when we started with the words like immortality, right? That, that worked at the time because it was, yeah, <laughs> it was going, yeah. <laughs> 
you know, immortality was was awesome because then everybody listened. Uh, then Aubrey came out and started saying, you know, people are going to live a thousand years, people who are born already, and 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 all of that was great, and it, it, it may still be be true, and it, it, I'm not saying none of this is true, it's, it is, but it's not the type of language that we keep using because we see that, first of all, for example, not only for the, for the general audience, but for in the scientific field, it's been very negative for us. So then we, you know, we adapted to okay, what are we doing here really is working on, on healthy longevity. Now we, we almost don't even talk about longevity a lot because we, 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 we say all these things because it's true that we're going to have longevity, but what we're really working on that is going to bring longevity is health. And it's, it's as simple as that. It's so known and accepted. It's nothing out of this world like people think it is, you know? It's just, so I think the more we, we talk to people like that, uh, we will have more people on our side when they see that this is just another therapy. It's just another way of approaching uh, the medicine that treats aging. Gerontology and geriatrics are extending um, ill health life. And that's all we want to change. We don't want that because we're going to, it's, it's unsustainable. Yes, indeed. So David, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I've, I've heard, Maria, I've heard you perform like at uh, Radfest, like the shirt that I'm wearing here today. And brilliant, I love your performances, but I think that also goes to the subject that we're talking about as far as outreach. I mean, we can try to discuss, you know, longevity, uh, transhumanism from, a, from an intellectual point of view, from a rational point of view, but music performance really touches people at a very fundamental spot. And I'm wondering yes. if you consider your music part of your part of your outreach. I think that is uh, I, I think that combination is wonderful. You know, if I was as famous as Lady Gaga, <laughs> <laughs> I would make big progress in the in the longevity field probably. I, that would give me a lot of tools for me to to make to help this progress, but unfortunately, I'm not. And and, and it, you know, it's it, in part it, it's my fault because I didn't I didn't pursue, you know, as much as I wanted when I was younger to to have a bigger career, even though I did a lot. But then at one point, I I realized that I my life made more sense if I dedicated myself to raise funds for research and to do what I'm doing. But I'm now um, coming back to it, and I, you know, I never stopped singing, as you know, you, you've seen me at that. But um, but I'm, I'm coming back to it, and, and um, I started learning piano to accompany myself a little bit. You know, it's st I'm still not really good at it, but I'm I'm trying it. And um, I think yes, I think arts influence culture so strongly, and then culture you know, arts and culture dictate everything, it, all the changes, and, and, and that's what pushes boundaries, to, just like science does, and it's all so interconnected. Um, so I, um, yeah, I mean, I wish I could do more from, 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 from that part, but as I said, you know, I need a, I need a record deal, so. Well, many of us were in attendance at every one of the rad fests, and we've seen you perform live on stage. Your uh, 2018 performance was quite memorable. And then you did one for the 2020 virtual Radfest as well, which was quite interesting uh, because you yeah. collaborated with uh, three musicians and you were each performing in your own spaces. Uh, the song was Fork in the Road. Yeah, the quarantine videos, right? That we mm -hmm. we all started, all musicians started doing making. Yeah. Yes, and that was, I think, quite a fitting song and message to articulate uh, during the time of the pandemic, during the time of the increasing unrest and polarization in our society, and the message of the song is essentially 
we have this very bright future to look forward to, but we risk losing everything if we let hatred and division consume us. Yes, that's right. Yeah, such a beautiful song that yeah. I wish I wrote <laughs> <laughs> by Judith <laughs> Owen. Yeah. Yes, uh, but I think you channeled it in a way that really spoke to the life extension advocates, to the transhumanists, because we can see the future beyond this pandemic, beyond the time of troubles that we're in currently. And I think sometimes, uh, just as you described with your early life in Argentina and with the lives of many people throughout the world, if they're consumed by these daily struggles and uncertainties, it's hard to see the big picture. We need someone to remind us of that. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then, if you if you think about it deeper, uh, what you just said about the daily struggles, aging it it is it is a basic thing that we should be working on, right? Even though it's hard to convey like that when people don't have food, etc. But um, I think the burden of that causes and the suffering and the expense. It's just so huge that I think everything will get better if we could get it under medical control, everything else. Yes, absolutely. Uh, imagine if people were able to go through life thinking that they can expect their health to remain strong, uh, to continue to have energy, to continue to have vitality for as long as they want. Uh, I think that's yeah. going to change people's expectations of life and of the world. Uh, Alexandria Black uh, asks a question that I think is fitting here. She wonders, does resistance to considering life extension mostly stem from resistance uh, about reframing expectations about life? I think so many people may be conditioned to believe that life involves an element of misery and suffering? Do you think uh, sometimes people are reluctant to even envision an alternative? Yes, I think people are, are you know, like over the course of the aging trends and, and people are scared of also getting their hopes up because they don't believe it's true it, because it's never been true, right? And, and, and re throughout recorded history, we've been promising the fountain of youth and it never, it was never true, snake oil, you know? And so I think a lot of people just, they don't want to get their hopes up. They don't want to think this is possible at all because they don't want to be disappointed. And, and they're so conditioned already to the fact that um, like, like, uh, like, uh, like she says, like uh, Alexandra says that we are going to suffer and that's part of it. it. It's, it's, it's really hard to break that program. And I think some big discoveries will have to uh, change that either that, or it's going to happen <clears throat> very little, you know, slowly, little by little, and it's going to take a long time, which is not what we want. Uh, hopefully it will be more like you know, like Elon Musk style, right? Like I call it like Ma Musk speed for for um, life extension. But but yes, Alexandria. Yes, indeed. True. So you came to the United States in 1992, and as we know, in 2000, Aubrey de Grey formulated his SENS approach, where he identified the seven types of damage that are involved in biological aging and proposed a, an engineering-based set of solutions to those types of damage. But there were eight years between when you came to the US and when the SENS approach was formulated. So I'm curious, uh, what were your experiences in between those two events? When did you meet Aubrey and how did you start uh, becoming involved with sense yes yes um so i i moved to the u.s with a full scholarship to study at berkeley college of music in boston so i i went there and i i did all my years of of uh, of uh, studying and um and it was a great experience and i was always you know thinking about um, aging and immortality and 
loving life so much and bombing because it was going to end one day, you know. I always had that in my head, but my full-time life was music. Um, so I was, um, uh, I moved to New York and um, that was um, probably, let me see, 19, I think it was like 1995 or something like that. And, and then I stayed there for a year and then I, I came to LA um, because I was going to be, I, I was casted by Oliver Stone to be Evita before Madonna's Evita. Uh, it was gonna be a small underground movie and I did all the auditions and I got casted by him to, to do that, to play the role and it didn't happen, it fell, but that's another story. But so just to tell you that I was still on, in, in my, uh, artistic career full time and and but I would always read you know about genetics and about aging and I didn't know about over yet uh, when I moved to LA one day um, I was doing some you know I came back from a long tour that I did with um, I was touring with a singer called Luis Miguel you may have heard of big artist from Mexico and um, and then I went to Japan and then I came back and I kind of took a break from music. Sometimes I, I started feeling that I needed something else. Um, and I had a lot of interest uh, in aviation also. And then, you know, I became a pilot later in, in 2005. So I contacted Aubrey, I think it must have been 2003. When I found him online, I, I had no idea he existed and he was, he was not famous yet. And uh, he had this uh, this crappy website on uh, on the in the in the Harvard um, University uh, no what am I saying Cambridge University um, web portal and he had a corner there with but the information was so amazing and I found that because I was I feel strange sometimes about telling this but I went to I googled um, immortality. And, and something like biology, mortality, aging, and then boom, Aubrey came as the first result. And uh, and I'm like, oh, who's this guy? And uh, wow, what an interesting beard. And, and so I, I started reading and I said, oh my God, this guy's brilliant. I need to contact him. I need to, I, I need to do something with him. And then, you know, telling myself, what are you gonna do? You're a singer. And, you don't have a, you know, a background, a scientific background. Well, there's something I, could, I must be able to do to help him spread the word. And so I wrote an email to him and he replied in within like half an hour. And I said, I'm, my mind is, you know, I'm blown away by all your information on this website. Uh, I am a singer. I, I've been reading about biology and genetics and aging all my life and so, so interested in it and that there's something we can do about it. And I just found you. I, I want to help you. I want to be in touch with you. And, and he wrote back and said, oh, and I said, and I speak several languages. Uh, maybe I can help you translating so that everybody can understand what you're saying in different countries. And so he wrote back and said, okay, yeah, start uh, by translating into Spanish my my website and he sent me all these texts. It was, I was so excited. So that's what I started doing uh, from LA uh, for Aubrey and, um, and I translated. And as I was translating, you know, I started interacting with him, asking him for a lot of techni technical words. I didn't know what they meant, you know, and I started researching and phew, my mind went, phew, it became three times bigger. <laughs> my brain <laughs> didn't fit in my head in, in a few months anymore. And then, um, one day he invited me to the first, uh, to the SENSE conference in Cambridge. So that must have been 2006, I think it was. And I went uh, to the conference and I met him for the first time and he came uh, riding his bicycle and with, uh, with Adelaide who was, was his wife back then. And uh, yeah, and then that's it, you know, we just, never stopped working together and my relationship grew and grew and grew and I started doing more more things getting more involved and and back then uh, there was Methuselah Foundation with Dave Gobel 
So I was um, volunteer coordinator and chapter coordinator, and I had a chapter in LA, I was organizing meetings every month, so much. Yes, indeed. Well, I first became acquainted with Aubrey's work in 2004, and I remember the Cambridge website uh, of which you spoke. I had just taken advanced placement biology in high school, and the summer after that experience, I came upon Aubrey's website, and I read his description of each of the seven uh planks of the Sen's approach. And I found it to be quite persuasive based on my knowledge of biology at the time. So uh, I wrote to him and you're entirely correct in your observation. He is very responsive. He was very responsive then and he continues to be uh, now. Yes. I don't know how he has the energy to respond to all of the people who must be uh, writing to him all the time and to give as many interviews as he does essentially to spend uh, whatever time he has available in popularizing uh, these possibilities. It's just he is absolutely brilliant and his capacity is beyond anything you can imagine. That's why he can do that. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Let me let me intervene because Maria, uh, at that time I was reading his website in Spanish, but I didn't know it was you who translated it. <laughs> that's so, why you have all the that's why you have all the concepts wrong now when you talk about longevity. <laughs> No, no, but I also like to talk about immortality still for the next uh, few years because it brings attention in, in the Spanish yes. world. And, you know, we are behind 10 years or more of what is happening in the English speaking world. So talking about immortality in Spanish is, it brings attention. It which is, is true. What it went to do. We're behind with every, and with music. It's always been the same. It's, it's been funny. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, I still think we have to be careful, but but you are more in touch with that world than I am anymore. Now, I think Spanish and Latin American music have a lot to teach the rest of us uh, about music. Uh, that is uh, an absolute certainty in my mind. There's just such an abundance of creativity there. Uh, but in terms of longevity, uh, awareness and advocacy. Uh, how would you characterize the state of those fields in Argentina and in other Latin American countries? Both Maria and Jose, if you can provide insights Ooh, on this. Yeah, I think Jose knows better than I do at this point. Uh, well, with the World Transhumanist Association a long, long time ago, uh, when it started in 1998-99, I became a member and I was also a director of the board of the World Transhumanist Association that later became Humanity Plus. I actually created chapters uh, in 10 countries in Latin America, uh, Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and even in Spain. So I helped to, to get some of the communities together and we have become friends uh, in this part of the world. And so when uh, the website of Aubrey the Great came into Spanish, also we popularized it a lot. But again, I'm so glad to know that it was you, Maria. I didn't <laughs> know that. I didn't know that until now. So I'm so glad and uh, so happy. That was that you the first thing I... It was the first thing I ever did for for you know for Aubrey and for the mission really truly actively doing something. It was that yeah. So so the communities in Latin America, Spain, Portugal, Brazil, um, because we have more or less a common language, Spanish and Portuguese, which are very similar, and uh, we are um, closely related. The transhumanists, the immortalists, and the uh, cryonics people as well. And you should yeah. talk about that because you have a lot of experience with cryonics, uh, Maria. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have a lot of experience, but I became a member in 2007 of Alcor. Um, that was because of Aubrey. Aubrey asked me if I was a member and I said no. And he said, oh, you should do that immediately. 
So I, yeah, I went to an Alcor conference in 2007 because I wanted to understand it. I want to understand the science and, and it totally made sense to me. So who, who is an Alcor or, or crayonist here? How many of you? Gennady, you're not. Not, not, not at this good. time. I, I think I'm waiting for uh, two developments uh, to be uh, actualized. One is uh, perhaps an improvement in the affordability and the other uh, an improvement in some of the cryopreservation techniques. But we've had a lot of salons on the subject in the recent past with okay. people like <laughs> Ashwin DeWolf and Rudy Hoffman, uh, who uh, really have an up-to-date understanding of the state of the field. So I'm very interested in the ongoing developments and in how to make cryonics widely available to the public. I think what hmm. will be needed for most people to consider it as an option will be for it to be essentially offered as the third alternative to burial and cremation through funeral mm. homes and yes. for more life insurance companies to be willing to underwrite policies uh, where the cryonics organizations are uh, the beneficiaries. David Shoemaker points out in our chat that current age is also a factor in uh, considering when to uh, make that decision. Of I don't my... agree with any of that. I think you guys are wrong. It's never too early to do it. Yeah, I don't. But again, I don't push people. You know, it's uh, in in, this, yeah. in these matters. But I think, and also regarding what you were saying, Janari, about the technology being better. Yes, I understand that. But and we have no idea if this is going to work, and we're we are working hard on preserving the best we can, but how we're going to eliminate all the toxicity that those carb yes. servants create in our bodies and how we're going to fix that body, we have no idea. But what we know is that if we don't do that, we know very well what's going to happen to us. And that's, I think, uh, what makes sense to me. And that, that's it. You know, even if the chance is tiny, 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 you can even see it, it's better than the zero chance, which is the other one. So... That's so but, true. But yeah, That's I mean, so Argent, yeah, yeah. So you just if you can afford it, basically, yes, do it. And and I think there are many ways now. And 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 for young people to get the uh, life insurance is it's very affordable. I I I, uh, I got it in two thousand seven when I was still young when I was twenty one. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but no, but but I um, and I think I pay something like seventy dollars a month. Mm. It's not a big deal. Uh, anyway, in Argentina, I, I led together with a couple of people from a small team that we have in Argentina and Rodolfo Goya, who is a famous, uh, sci um, you, you know who he is, probably a um, uh, scientist from Argentina who works a lot in crowd preservation. And he was one of the co-authors of the paper that we did after um, comparing the cryopreservation of my mother's brain and, sorry, I'm mixing it all up. I led the cryopreservation of my mom's brain. It was the first cryopreservation done in Latin America and it was done in Argentina. And I had no idea how I was going to do that when I was there. I, I went there to try to save my mother. I couldn't save her. So then I had a few days to put together this cra crazy thing that was for, for Argentina. But the fact that the, they were, there was this lack of regulations that helped a lot, right? Um, it doesn't happen in every country. Some countries, there are some regulations that make it really hard. So what I did, it was I found a uh, tanatologist in a tanatory where they process bodies and, and do um, embalming and stuff like that. And I found a, a surgeon who removed the brain and uh, Anyway, we made it happen. It was incredible. It was not very expensive. And I think we set a, a new standard that can be used for, for the rest of the countries that don't have a lot of resources. And that's why we did the, the peer reviewed the paper, scientific paper later, uh, correlating the type of preservation with rat brains so that we could see what kind of preservation my mom got and if it was 
something worth promoting for, for other countries to adopt it when they didn't have access to, you know, certain chemicals, you know, like M22 and carboservants and, 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 and other uh, structures that are not in place. So that was, yeah, that's what Jose was saying. I know a lot about crab preservation. Um, and that was, yeah, I feel very lucky that I could do that with mom. And, um, and mom, uh, my mom's brain was brought here uh, to um, Greg Face lab, uh, 21st century medicine. And now um, I think I can already say this because it's already approved. Um, it's going to go to Alcor for, it, it's entering a research project at Alcor that is led by Greg Fay also, and, you know, Ashwin is also involved and, uh, and she's going to stay there, but, but she's, she's part of Alcor's research. Yes, that's quite fascinating and quite a journey from Argentina to Alcor. Uh, she was cryopreserved in 2018, you said? Yes, in um, September 9th, 2018. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, uh, and she, yeah, I, I, I tortured myself thinking about how am I going to make this happen for her when the time comes. And Rodolfo Goya was always connected with me. And then uh, Francisco Lascaray, also in Argentina. Uh, and we were all brainstorming and my mom used to come to meetings there with the group and she was very excited about this possibility and I promised I was going to make it happen make it happen for her and, and I, I did it yeah yes indeed and uh, it's great that you went to such amazing lengths for your mother to uh, at least have a hope of preserving her in the future but yeah. I, I wonder, uh, what did you have to do to arrange for the transportation over that kind of distance, especially to multiple facilities over time? Yes, um, I have to say that <laughs> as simple as I tell the story, it was I could make a movie uh, with, with the story. And um, uh, it was really hard to, to take the brain out of Argentina. The, the government wouldn't allow me to. It was very complicated. I, don't, I right now don't even remember all the steps that we had to go through and why they didn't want me to do this. And I had to go through all these different, uh, you know, agencies, government, governmental agencies and get all these permits. And it was very complex, but we ended up making it happen. And Rodolfo again helped a lot. And we, um, arranged uh, with this, there's a, a specialized uh, company called World Courier and they, they transport organs um, mm. for transplant. And they, you know, I think they never transported a brain because unfortunately we still don't do that with mm. transplant brains. They just, when I talked to the, trans, the company that is in charge of, of that in Argentina actually, because I needed someone to take the organ out and, and, they, and, and I said, can you help me with that? And they said, no, we, it's just that we don't do that because we, we, just, we just trash the brains. They, 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 and I remember how impactful that was to me, right? Like, you know, they keep a lot of other organs in, 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 in retinas, but they, the brains, they just get rid of them. They just discard them. And, um, so yeah, they never transport the brain, but they, they did and they were excellent. And I had, I had temperature control that I could, I, I had it, live I could see I could go online I could see what temperature was in the box where she was it was a box and a box and a box and a box and there was a lot of dry eyes and it was uh, an expensive thing to do and uh, but not but not that expensive not not some some amount that you wouldn't be able to to afford uh, and she, yeah and then she got to Greg's lab in perfect condition and and um, now she's still there. She's still not at Alcor, but she's but everything's approved, and she's gonna go to Alcor as, as soon as Greg finishes doing some some research, taking some samples, and doing some CT scans of the brain, etc. And, and and the transportation there should be easy. I'm not sure what we're gonna use that yet, but something similar to that. Yes. Well, once she is in 
the capable hands of scientists like Greg Fay, I wouldn't have too many concerns about the quality of her preservation, but uh, I'm sure getting her from Argentina to the United States uh, was the greatest source of worry and uncertainty. I want to add something quickly that when I was doing the preservation there, I was in touch with my, as I call it, my health longevity family here. Since the moment I got there when my mom was very sick, she had sepsis in, in the beginning. She had many things, but that was one of them. And I was in touch with people like Bill Falloon and, and Greg was also helping. And Bill Falloon sent me a protocol that took my mother out of sepsis in 48 hours. When the doctors told me she had one in 10 chances to, to survive the sepsis, the septic shock. Uh, so I thought she was going to be saved and she had a, a punctured intestine and, and then everything went crazy and surgeries and she couldn't make it. But, but when I decided, okay, that's it. She's not going to live. We have to preserve her. Uh, Greg was, was so important. He, he was from here telling us everything about the chemicals to use and he was key uh, in the preservation. He, and, then, and, and there were other people involved offering their help too, like Elena Milova. Uh, and her mother with Cryo Russ and, um, and, and I think Ben Best also. I don't want to forget names, but there was a big list of people who were present there for me, helping me with all kinds of advice for, for how to make this preservation happen. And, and the paper that published is called Cryopreservation of a Human Brain and its Experimental Correlate in Rats. Uh, could you perhaps discuss that paper in greater detail? It was published in 2020. Yes, so I will not be able to discuss it in great detail because I'm not a scientist. And I, even though I understand what happened, I don't want to get into it because I don't want to say the wrong stuff. <laughs> But I, but I can tell you that the, yes, the idea was to, to check, you know, to do A, B, like we say in music with the, my mom's case and, and, and follow exactly the same protocol in the rat's brains and dissect them so we can see how much damage, uh, if, if a lot or any, uh, that pro type of protocol would have caused to her brain and uh, give a, to give us an idea of how much of the information has been preserved. And, uh, and we, the result tells us good, good stuff. We, we believe it's, it's, a very, it's a decent preservation. Uh, of course, it's something that it would probably take longer time for her to be fixed and revived, if you want to say it like that. Um, repaired um, be, than, you know, a perfect preservation than uh, at Alcor with all the right chemicals and the best of, of the best, but it's, it's a very viable option and it's, it's affordable and it's avail it's, it, it involves types of chemicals that are available uh, in, most, in most, most, most everywhere. So that was very important to do the paper to see since we cannot cut my mom's brain to see what happened, but, but we did it with, with the little poor animals. And uh, we found out that it, um, it, it worked. Yes. Oh, the is... details of what that means should have been given to you by Rodolfo probably. Mm -hmm. That is encouraging. And I did find a link to the paper that I shared in the YouTube chat. So any of our viewers who are interested in more details will hopefully be able to access the paper directly. Yes. And they can email me if it, what you found actually downloads the PDF or it just gives you the abstract. It does download the PDF file. Uh, in okay. fact, yes, uh, I just downloaded Perfect. it myself. And this is the research gate website that yeah. allows one to download PDFs uh, of certain uh, peer-reviewed articles. This was published in Rejuvenation Research That's in right. June of 2020. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, so, I, I think I, I made available the PDF on ResearchGate. I think, yeah. 
So that's great. I, I, yeah, because for a while we, I, I had to send it to people personally, but I'm glad to hear that anybody can go and get it. Mm -hmm. So Brent, you have a question for Maria about cryonics. Yeah, um, a question that I have for you, Maria, is uh, something, a concern that I have regarding cryonics is, are, are there any places that you know of, since you focus on global outreach, where there are rights in place for people who have undergone cryotherapy? Um, you know, like, for instance, I know that there's a fictional book series that I've enjoyed called We Are Legion, and somebody gets cryogenically preserved and wakes up and he's property of the state, and they pump him into a von Neumann probe and blast him into outer space. And it, you know, it's a fictional read, but I do wonder if, you know, those are, that is a concern I have. Am I going to, if I were to undergo such a thing, what kind of world am I going to wake up in? Um, yes, I, it's true that I do a lot of outreach. Most of my outreach, though, and my focus, my, my time, my energy have to do with, with the longevity and the, the raising the funds and, and everything that has to do with curing aging. Cryonics, which is the plan B, and, uh, and, and it's very important, too. But I, I am not that knowledgeable of, of, of what you're asking me. I think, unfortunately, there's not much of that that we can say now that we're going to be protected for sure in the future. And, but, I, but it's possible Jose knows something about this. If you do, Jose, you're welcome to. Uh, there, there's another group called the Asset Preservation Group um, that they get involved into how can we prepare for the future when we're revived. And that, that, that's an interesting group. I can give you the contact of the people, the person that runs it. Uh, and then Jose, uh, the person that runs it, uh, and and they and they also what they do is they help you, they you know uh, keep your assets, your money. So when you wake up in the future, you have something, and you you still have your money and all that the kind of stuff. And I'm, but I'm pretty ignorant about it, really. I have to assume, I have to accept. Uh, maybe Jose. Well, there are different groups being created to help support people interested in cryonics. Um, in Argentina, actually, uh, Maria had help from some friends. The same we have here in Spain. There are some groups being created in Mexico. And then uh, financially as well, uh, people try to collaborate for people who are willing to to go through cryopreservation. Like we also paid for one that I coordinated in, in Spain, the first one in the Iberian Peninsula in the continental part of Spain also in 2006, uh, five years ago. Uh, so a group of um, cryonicists from Spain, we collaborated in all of this and also to get the, the brain outside of Spain. And we sent our friend because it was also a dear friend of ours uh, to Germany. So he's in a small facility now in Dresden, Germany, because in in Spain, like in Argentina, there are no there is no legality for this. And, uh, and so we wanted to make sure that our friend uh, was in good condition and he could not be uh, thrown out or burnt or, or destroyed. So we sent him out into Germany. Jose, I think Brent is asking about after you're revived. Is that what you're asking, Brent? Yeah, a little of both. Um, just, you uh, know, like how people talk about rights of like fetuses and things like that. Are there, you know, people out there that already exist who are trying to protect the rights of people who choose to, you know, be preserved, you know, post oh, okay. um, reanimation or just while they're, you know, cryogenically preserved? Yeah, I don't think there's much about that yet yeah, there's there's still it's still a lot a lot of uh, trouble even sometimes getting someone cryopreserved because anybody can be against it in the family and then we have to we have to um, use so many different resources sometimes to make sure that that nothing's going to interfere and that we're going to actually get cryopreserved it's still hard like, you know like for example we have to make a or, or some people do, I don't know if everybody knows about this, but um, we have to make statements saying that it's, it's a religious belief so that, you know, in, in different states, you know, it works differently, what kind of things you have to sign and say so that the that police is not gonna take the body and put it in a morgue for, for two weeks, you know? And and so, um, yeah, and, and you know, and, and, and Alcor has a license of a cemetery and there's, we're still trying to use a lot of like loopholes and things to even, 
So I, I don't think that stuff is, is, is in place, but it will, it will little by little. But, but also maybe I'm wrong and there's more that I don't know. I think Max Moore will be the perfect person to ask. Roger. Hopefully. Yeah, I was just going to say that definitely seems like something that is would be uh, encouraging to be aware of if I were to sign. You know, I, I've looked into Alcor for myself as well as for my dog and things like that. And uh, there, you know, there are just certain things that kind of concern me that in the, and that's definitely something maybe the U.S. Transhumanist Party can kind of petition for those types of rights. That's true. But what you, what you, should, we, you should be more concerned about is, is the other stuff, you know, which is not being a member of anything and then disappearing forever and never and never definitely <laughs> i just worry about like waking up property of the state or something like that you know oh man i prefer wake up in any state you know that's and fair wake up and then if i don't like it i was already dead so i can <laughs> have to die you know but but i can make the option that's what is exciting to have the option that's what is important definitely it's not yes. certainty but there's some and John Halloran uh, points out in the YouTube chat that there was a case, uh, it's now two years ago where a family overrode the wishes of a woman uh, who wanted to be cryopreserved and they cremated her. Instead, that was the case of uh, Danielle Baker and the US Transhumanist Party did actually issue a statement about that, essentially uh, criticizing that decision and supporting the rights of cryonics patients to determine what will happen to them after legal death is declared. Unfortunately, the coroner of the county she was in did not respect her wishes. Yeah, that's very uh, so scary stuff. We do yeah. need to advocate. Mm -hmm. We do that's need to scary. advocate yeah. for protections. Now, I do wonder uh, with regard to that scenario that Brent posed, if we do ever get a person successfully revived from cryopreservation, we would of course be in a much more advanced future society. In that society, it should be clear to the people of that time, this is a human being who is alive like uh, the rest of the human beings uh, of that society. So why wouldn't that person have full legal rights? If you had a person uh, walk into uh, your community uh, and maybe he had lived in the wilderness uh, for a while, but he is fully human and able to interact as a human, maybe with some differences, some cultural differences, because he had been away from the society for a long time. That's kind of analogous to having a uh, revived cryonics patient in a future society. That person might need to adapt to the norms of that society, but uh, hopefully the people then will be enlightened enough to see him or her as fully human. David, do you have some thoughts on that? Oh, I certainly do. <laughs> I just want to say that I think it's human nature that we generally want certainty. We want to know exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Quite honestly, that could be part of the appeal of why people choose death over other potential possibilities. Death is the only certainty that you can have at that point. So something like cryonics is uncertain and I think that natural bias towards uh, certainty keeps it away. So as I'm looking at this, I'm saying that if you want certainty, if you don't want any problems, choose death. And if you're willing to take on, you know, a little bit of risk and a little bit of uncertainty, well, then maybe cryonics has a play there for you. But uh, you know, quite seriously, though, I think that it is really ground into the human animal to want certainty. And that's something that I think that as rational beings, we need to address and decide what level of risk are we willing to take? Yes, definitely all this stuff is not for everybody. That's for sure. And I respect that. So now let us go to our vice chairman, Arin Vahanian, who has a question about marketing and outreach, uh, which is closely related to your work for the SENS Research Foundation. So, Arin, please proceed. Thank you so much, Janari, and thank you, Maria, for attending today. I'm really happy you're here. I have to admit, 
I was bugging Janari for months to invite you. So I'm really glad uh, <laughs> that you accepted. Janari! <laughs> <Yeah, nice. laughs> Thank you. And uh, so I have a question about outreach and marketing. Besides making donations to SENS, which, which is great, which is which we should definitely always be promoting that. Because of course, any organization could use more funding in order to further its goals. But I was just curious, Maria, your opinion on what else can we in the community do, whether it's longevity, uh, transhumanists or people in, in the longevity community, besides donating the SENS and other organizations, what else can we do to help you? Because at least here in the USTP, we have a large membership of you know, a few thousand people and we would like to leverage the community in order, in, in order to help you. So what else, what else would you like to see? What else can we do to help out, to spread the word? Spread the word, I think is, it just tells everything there in that phrase, right? So each, each person that is part of this, of the party, if they spread the word, if they tell as many friends as they can, and especially finding those people, like I was saying before, who are waiting to hear about this, and then they, they, they are gonna be excited. Um, because what, what I think is very important is that there is a change in, in the culture that for this to actually happen at some point, even more than the science, even though the science obviously is very, very critical, but but the more people want this, um, the sooner it's going to happen. So, you know, we need we need people to. Um, well, there's two things. One is obviously if we could make this happen from a, from a more official point of view. Also, we need to we need to make the governments to realize that the the way of treating aging is not what we're doing, it's geriatrics and gerontology. So that will be something very important, lobbying, you know, talking to the authorities that work in health that have the power of changing the paradigm of how healthcare is run in, in people who are 65 and older. Um, and I understand that what we need to do is, is, is put more money into the biology of aging and understanding how, how aging works and um, and working on, on preventing um, the diseases of aging by repairing the damage and, and all that approach that you probably know about from, uh, from SENSE, but, but not, we are still working with the private sector only. And if we could, if we could involve the government, um, you know, that'd be huge. So, so that's, that's something that we're actively working on. And if anybody out there that, that is, uh, uh, part of the transhumanist party or people who are following the, the, the longevity field um, can help with that. Um, we are always looking for connections, new leads and introductions. And, and that's what, you know, would be amazing that, that there was, uh, that there would be at a governmental level, a, a department that is, is dedicated to aging, but different, you know, seen from this different approach that is not um, just keep the person comfortable and slow down aging, but revising what is aging, what can we do something different about it? Can we, can we fix it in a different way or not just slow it down? Um, so that, that would be huge other than, than the, I would say funding number one, because there are enough people already in the scientific field who know what to do to, to at least start making a big progress in, in terms of curing aging. So we need the funding to make that, to move that machine, right? We have that already enough knowledge for that. But also what would be amazing would be if the, if the official sources that are, that are spending so many trillions of dollars keeping old people alive in terrible state would realize that there is another approach to it that is so much better. Um, so that I know it's not simple if you <clears throat> tell everyone because not everyone can get to the government, but <clears throat> I think the more people want this, the government will listen at some point and then that's how, how it's going to happen, right? Yes, indeed. And I think everyone can play a role in 
outreach and advocacy. Uh, indeed, anybody watching this salon either right now as it is live streamed or watching the recording, go on Facebook, share the link to uh, your social media pages, go on Twitter, tweet about this event. Hopefully you'll bring in some additional people who will be intrigued by the subjects of conversation uh, because I do think there's a role for the general public to spread these ideas in a grassroots fashion. And also, Aaron, <clears throat> for people to find ways of communicating the message in different ways. You know, I would like to see all kinds of, you know, types of languages and formats on how to explain aging and why this is a, a, a thing about health and it's not something creepy. And so I, I want to see, sometimes we organize competitions, you know, with uh, the International Longevity Alliance that I'm, I'm a member of the world directors and, and you know, for people to create little films and, and animations and explain what this means, what we're working on. That's very important too, that, there, that we find all kinds of ways because people, different people need to hear it differently. Um, there's not one, just one way of telling people. And that's something that I've been learning too. When I start into talking with somebody and I'm going to introduce them to the, the, the concept of, of addressing aging, I have to feel and see what is that, how they're going to understand it. Everybody is going to absorb it differently and you have to say it differently. So, yeah, so that also I would like to see um, pr people proposing different ways of, of spreading the message. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And uh, Jennifer Hughes in our chat uh, asks, what about expanding the outreach department so that it gets into public relations with celebrities, et cetera. The more persons that have large networks and influence like celebrities and politicians, uh, the better we can spread the word. And I know the Sense Research Foundation has uh, collaborated with some celebrities like uh, Edward James Olmos and Steve Aoki. So perhaps uh, you could talk a bit about that and how they got involved and what got them excited about the Sens message and willing to contribute. Well, yes, totally, totally true. And I wish we could have a lot more celebrities with us uh, spreading our message. Um, so Edward James Olmos it is a friend of mine. He's been a friend of mine for a long time. I met him through his film festival in Los Angeles when I was invited to sing in it years ago. And we became really close friends. And, and then we one day I realized that he had a very open mind about the future and that he knew about Ray Kurzweil and he loved reading about the singularity. And when he told me that, I said, oh, my God, you listen to this. You know, I, I've been singing all my life, but now I'm, I'm uh, getting involved in this other thing that, that I've been thinking about always since I was a little girl. And, and it's about aging. And, you know, I told him, he's like, wow, that's amazing. That's, yeah, you know, I actually, I thought about it, but I thought there was nothing to do and we could do it. And he's like, I have my total support. And so I brought him into the foundation and every time we could, you know, use his image, you know, that, that, of course, you know, people, a lot of people follow him and love him and uh, he's, he's really awesome. So that happened because I, 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 I've been in the entertainment business for a long time. And that was actually part of why, uh, you know, I got my job at Sense because I have this big network and, and, you know, same thing uh, with Steve Aoki and, and, and Herbie Hancock. And, um, you know, we have other, other names uh, that have been, um, supporting but we definitely need a lot more and um and we do re reach out the what happens with celebrities is they always they always uh, they're always waiting for for the the other celebrity to to do it so they can do it right they're they're very very concerned about their image and and about coming out and saying something crazy and but we have um some things in the works now with some big celebrities. We, you know, one of the other persons that we we do stuff with is Joe Rogan, and um, he's great. And we are now connecting more and more with with uh, with new celebrities. And it's 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 a good point. It's 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 gonna keep growing. I 
you know, where few people at SENS, uh, we're still a very small organization, believe it or not, even though we're very famous and we all do a lot of things at the same time. And that is one of the things that we need to focus on, especially me, myself. And um, and I think 2021, maybe we, we will be able to bring some new celebrities. That would be awesome. Yes. Well, I'm quite intrigued to uh, see what celebrities uh, you're able to bring on. But Brent, you had something to say. Yeah, I just heard you mention Herbie Hancock, and I was uh, kind of intrigued to hear his involvement in all this. Yeah, well, Herbie also, um, I known him for a long time through the music business. And um, I created in 2000, I would say 13, maybe, or 12, 14, I don't remember. I created a campaign for, for Sense called the Celebrity Campaign. Celebrity, no, it was not called the Celebrity Campaign, but the Aging Celebrity. What Basically, I would go to celebrities and, and and prominent names from different types of worlds. You know, like we have Peter Diamandis and Dean Kamen and, 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 and some ambassadors and some, you know, uh, all kinds of people. I, I'll find that and I'll, I'll, I'll provide a link um, if I can. I think we still have that somewhere. So when I created that campaign, um, I went to celebrities and I asked them, what, I just want a photo from you and I want a, a quote from you called what aging means to you. And it was very interesting because they all, they all had different, uh, some of them were positive things like, you know, aging to me means wisdom and experience, right? Um, but, but by doing that, we had all these faces of all these famous people uh, there on our website, it was it was a great campaign, and um, and and one of those was those faces was Herbie, and that was the first um, thing that we did with with him that I asked him, <laughs> I told him about our work. I put together a meeting here in in LA with him, uh, Aubrey flew in and, and Mike Cope, our ex CEO, and we explained the whole concept, and he loved it, so he agreed to endorse us. And then since then, you know, we've been counting on him for different things. So I, call, I just recently called him for one of our campaigns. You can see it on our website. If you go now on the top uh, of the hero um, slideshow, you can see one of them is Herbie's face. And then if you click there, you see a video from Herbie uh, encouraging people to participate in that campaign that we had that was called uh, Half My Death. Um, so he is, you know, one of the people that are there for us and, and when, you know, he's very busy and, uh, but when he has time, um, he, he, you know, just like Steve Aoki also does, he, you know, gives his, his some words for, endorses some of the campaigns and things like that. That's what basically, I, I, I've tried to, uh, to organize a concert with him, but um, I couldn't, I couldn't make that happen yet. <laughs> to fundraise. Cool. Very cool. Yes. I'm going to grab a little water just a second. And while Maria is doing that, I posted a link in the YouTube chat to the SENS Research Foundation website. If you go there, uh, you'll see uh, Herbie Hancock. You will see Edward James Olmos uh, on the top banner. You can scroll through and uh, click to see their videos, to see their statements about SENS and the importance of longevity research. So I would encourage you to do that. Uh, Alexandria Black writes in our internal chat, seems that the entertainment industry would be motivated to help. Uh, there always uh, seem to be the assumption of competition from fresher faces. So I think what Alexandria is saying is perhaps the celebrities who are a bit older may want to be more youthful in order to uh, remain in the spotlight. And it's interesting if you think about someone like Sean Connery, who had a very long and distinguished career, but unfortunately he died at the age of 90 and he was in very good health for a person in his 80s, but because of biological aging, he still ultimately succumbed. And I think a lot of famous celebrities may be in that situation 
soon if they aren't in it already, unless they can get these rejuvenation treatments. And this is something that Bill Falloon also emphasizes with the billionaires. Uh, there are all of these aging billionaires uh, who could be investing their money into longevity and rejuvenation research, but and, uh, for whatever yeah. reason, something is holding them back. It is very interesting. You That point about celebrities wanted, wanting to stay young, because it also affects their careers so much, right? They basically lose their careers, um, especially, you know, the, 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 the actresses that play the, or, or the actors that play the leading roles, and they're supposed to always stay beautiful. And uh, unfortunately, when you age, you lose your beauty. And, uh, and you would think they will want this, but they, is that all the other principles that we talked about before apply when you talk to them. It's the same thing, you know, they don't either don't believe in it, they're, they're, they're conditioned by, you know, this, this is the way it has to be. I'm not going to come out and say all this stuff when who, they're going to think I'm crazy. You know, there's always something, uh, of course, they don't tell you that, but they, um, respond in the same way that, that every, everyone else that is not a celebrity will respond when you ask them for support. It's the same thing, yeah. Yes, and even though the celebrities do help shape the culture, they are also shaped by it. So it's a kind of yes. bi-directional relationship where uh, they respond to cultural signals as well. And I think this is where uh, we, more ordinary people can have an influence on them by signaling that we favor these ideas, we find them intriguing, uh, so that the celebrities of, of whom we are the customers as well, uh, will find those causes to be worthwhile to uh, broadcast to the public. Because I think celebrities do pay attention to public opinion. Yes, they do. It's, it's, it's crazy because they will endorse immediately something like, you know, the uh, Alzheimer's organization or the, car, or the heart, uh, American Heart Association or cancer. But unfortunately, aging is not directly associated to disease by people. And that's what is so painful that we need to change in people's minds to understand that aging is actually nothing else but disease right it's the cause of disease and and you know we don't like to say aging is a disease because there's a lot of controversy on that but it, it definitely uh, as you age you know all your your chances of getting sick go up drastically so how can you separate aging from disease it's just impossible yes as Many of us in the longevity movement like to emphasize healthy people don't just drop dead for no particular reason. Yeah, yeah. And when they, <laughs> yeah, that is a big, uh, that, that is a confusion, a misconception, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, it'd be great because we're gonna, we're going to, uh, you know, some, both sides. Like what, sometimes people think that they're gonna be old and uh, they're gonna live for a long time in, in nobody, right? And uh, and then, uh, you know, you have to explain, no, because you're not gonna be alive if, if your body is getting sick. It's it's exactly, that's what prevents you from dying is that you're gonna be healthy. And, but yeah, it's, it's a confusion. It's, it's amazing. It's, it seems so easy to understand, but it's not for most of people. Yes, I do think it bears emphasizing because for many people, they try to use these kinds of superficial arguments to get the topic of life extension out of their minds to dismiss it somehow. But, you know, in every conversation I've had with a person who brought that up, if I said, well, look, you can't live much longer than today's maximum lifespans if you're not healthy. And if you are healthy, why do you think you're going to just drop dead at 90 or 100? And most people get it if it's explained to them in that way. And if they have other it. reservations, they move on to those yeah. other uh, reservations. Yeah. They don't stay at the argument of, oh, I don't want to be frail for a very long time. That's right. Yeah. When you tell them, no, it's, you're going to be like when you were 30 and you're going to be 90. So you're not going to die of because you're 90 and, but then yes, people have other questions and other, um, 
fears, right, concerns, right. a lot, a lot of them. And and that that's uh, what I found fascinating when I first discovered Aubrey's website. That you probably all remember, Gennady and uh, Jose, that he had addressed all the questions, uh, the common questions that, that people that people asked. And I found that awesome because you know I was already talking to people about these things, and people had these questions, and then I'm like, what? He already knows all these things, and yeah, it's Aubrey, of course. Right. Actually, I'd like, I'd like to add something. One thing I found helpful when speaking with people about life extension and uh, helping them become more amenable to it, as it were, I always ask this question to someone who seems like they're not, they're, they're against it or they don't like the idea. So I never try to convince people. I just ask this question. Wouldn't you like to live an additional five to 10 years of a healthy life? Who in their right mind is going to say no, right? Yeah. And so by asking these sorts of questions, we get them to uh, be more open about the possibility, right? So that's the way I always approach it. Maria, just yes. going back to what you were saying in the beginning of the in the beginning of this uh, beginning of this meeting, where you were saying it, it really it, it bothers you, right? When it, when people just don't see it, right? But I think for me at least. I found it helpful to not try to convince people, but to just show people, right? And then ask small questions and just help them along, right? So. Yeah, and, and I, I usually try to avoid the fact of extending life because that's what brings the most controversy. But if you are talking about ex life extension, that's, that's a good way of doing it. If you're not focusing on the health part, that it's a no brainer for everybody. Uh, but if you talk about that, extending the time you're going to be alive, given that you're going to be healthy, uh, yeah, you say, what, you know, sometimes I ask people, like, at what time do you want to die? You know, and people say, oh, you know, 84. <laughs> Why, what about 94, you know? And they're like, well, you know, it depends how I feel. And well, what about 110, you know? And, uh, and, and, and then another question that, that we ask also is like, at what time would you like to get Alzheimer's? At what age would you like to get Alzheimer's? And, uh, and then people like, people don't say anything. And you know, I want, okay, would you like to get Alzheimer's? Uh, you know, what, 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 oh no, the question should actually, actually we started asking that, but then now I ask like, would you like to get Alzheimer's when you're 65? People say, no. I say, what about when you're 85? <laughs> what about when you're a hundred? You know, when they never want to get Alzheimer's, right? There's there's no age that when you want to get Alzheimer's. So I think Brett uh, wants to say something. Yeah, I just um, kind of touching on what you were saying, Aaron. Um, I feel like the biggest thing that people use to you know argue against life extension and longevity is religious perspective uh, we were talking you were talking about christianity i think maria um but then you have buddhism talks about the wheel of samsara which is you know this idea of suffering and you know a lot of the whole buddhist uh, perspective is to overcome this wheel of samsara and to release ourselves and then you have gnosticism talks about the demiurge and that we're living in this you know evil realm or something along those lines is there a way to overcome that? Or I guess I, I think that your uh, perspective, Maria, about just kind of not wasting time on these types of people. Oh. Is... oh, 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 no. Now it sounds like I just said it like that. But yeah, you're right. It's kind of my thing. I mean, but, it's a good, but it's good recommendation. <laughs> it's not a lack of I, respect. It's just it's, the conversation won't go anywhere. <laughs> no, I think, I think, yeah, when it comes to that, um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't inter intervene. Honestly, yeah. I, I, like I said, I think I think these people would be open to the therapy when it comes out. I think so. I mean, most of them probably. Um, we always says, you know, that your religion. I mean, he studied all the religions, and, and he's so brilliant. You know, he can tell you what if every person that follows each religion would would think and why this could be a problem for them and and they knows how to answer to each of them uh, but uh but god never said uh you know for christianity for example never said at oh, what age you have to die right so the, there are a lot of religions i think um if you really analyze them deeply there's nothing wrong with, with living longer in fact 
in Christianity or I grew up Catholic, Catholic I'm an atheist now, but I grew up Catholic. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we talk about Methuselah, 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 we call it in Spanish, Methuselah, and, uh, and we talk about living forever all the time, right? Um, so I don't know, but, but and, and certain people who I know that are deeply spiritual and they truly don't want this. They do not want to stay here longer. And, and, and I feel that, that it's, it's, it's so strong in them. I would, I would not argue with them. I just would not. David, you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, I wanted to dovetail in on the end of that. Um, I wanted to go back to what I was saying earlier about, I think people make up their mind and then they rationalize. So I find that uh, when I'm having these kind of discussions, I consider myself to be both uh, uh, Christian and transhumanist at the same time. And I don't have any conflict between those two. But when I run into people of any religion, whatever it might be, that start talking back to me about the religious reasons for not doing that, I point out to them, especially if it's Christianity, which I'm more familiar with, I'll point out all the things in my understanding of Christianity that supports longevity and life yeah. protection. So I think that it goes back to people make up their mind before or against, and then they come up with arguments to support that. But the arguments they themselves are not the real reason it, it underlies that. They make their decisions emotion from their emotions, and then they need to rationalize to explain yes. why they yes. make the decisions. Exactly. And yeah, but it doesn't have to interf interfere with your religion, life extension. It doesn't have to. And Alexandria points out in the chat that all of the age estimations that people typically provide about how long they want to live include our usual expectations of frailty. And we can uncouple those expectations as we see healthier aging. And it's interesting because uh, even now it seems to me 50 years old doesn't mean what it used to mean. Uh, when I was growing up in Belarus, uh, I would generally think of 50 as kind of the beginning of senescence because the 50 year olds I saw looked like they were uh, quite obviously aging. But right now I see a lot of very healthy, fit, athletic 50 year olds. and. I'm not that far from 50 myself. I'm about 16 years away from uh, 50 now. And uh, to think that uh, <laughs> essentially uh, I've gone two thirds of the way there uh, already and I don't feel that old, it uh, kind of reconfigured my opinion of uh, what reaching the age of 50 would mean. So do you think at some point people will think of say 70 as not being uh, that old, and that might start a, kind of an evolutionary shift in their perspective of how long they want to live. So instead of saying 84, they might say 114. Definitely. Yes, I think so. I don't know when we're going to be able to change our lifespan. We definitely move the life expectancy up, but we still have not been able to change lifespan, right? Um, but beyond that, um, yes, I think, I think people will, will think differently when they, now I have so many friends who are 65 and 70 and it's incredible. I remember when I was a kid, that was not what a 65 or 70 year old person looked like or behaved or felt like it's very different. So yeah, I think so. Renati, I agree with you. Yes, indeed. So now I think it's a good opportunity to delve a little bit into the political aspect because David pointed out in our chat that uh, so just as celebrities follow public opinion and respond to it, so do politicians. And politicians also pay attention to what their constituents think if they see a critical mass of constituents who are in favor of a particular idea or set of proposals, they're more embrace 
them in their own rhetoric. And Jennifer Hughes in our YouTube chat also mentions uh, the importance of getting politicians on board with uh, these kinds of initiatives. And she writes also about attempting, uh, for instance, to run for local office and try to change things in a local area or even having a candidate for local office openly talk about longevity and transhumanism and the importance of research in those areas. Uh, so do you think that could help shift the uh, culture if we have candidates running uh, at local levels and of course for publicity purposes having candidates running for higher levels of office even though we're probably not going to win a presidential election we did have charlie cam last year running for president and uh, we got some good media exposure, some good interviews out of that. So where do you think that plays into the overall outreach strategy? Well, I think I, I talked about it a little bit before and yeah, and, and, I, I, and, and basically all I have to say is yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's very important. It's, uh, it's important because um, politics are culture it's it, it's all connected and um and then that's so connected to science and as we change uh, our culture we're we're going to affect the science and everything's gonna move faster so i think it's um yeah i think it's it, it, go for it <laughs> we need more people like us in in those in those seats urgently and and i don't think i don't think we have we have anybody right now. Yes, well, we are going to try. And in 2021, we hope to have some candidates we can endorse for a few local offices. So everyone stay tuned for news about this in the yeah. not too distant future. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Naomi in the chat says she thought I was younger. And it's interesting too, I, I'm starting to get to that age where sometimes people do tell me that I look younger than uh, my chronological age. Before people were telling me that I looked older than my chronological age. So I remember working at a TV station when I was 19 and I was preparing the the nightly news footage used the old 1980s Betamax technology. I was paid minimum wage, but I always went into the office with a suit and tie. And uh, I think it was because of that that people thought I was yes. older. So Your one of style. the news anchors, uh, yes, one of the news anchors said to me, uh, what are you like 40? <laughs> and now people are uh, sometimes saying that uh, I look younger than my chronological age. Well, I suppose that's progress. Uh, and I have- I, Are you doing any specific therapies or anything for that to reverse your aging? Is long distance running a therapy, I wonder, yeah. because I run uh, between 40 and 50 miles per week. I ran 8.15 miles before uh, today's salon in fact, and I do find wow. that it helps. I definitely have more endurance, more energy than I used to. And actually the body gets used to the long distances. So it's possible to run a half marathon and not feel any pain, not feel any discomfort much of the time. It, it varies of course, but uh, I, I get really good uh, blood test results. I have a heart rate in the 40s. Uh, so oh, wow. that has definitely helped me uh, with regard to fitness and the feeling of youthfulness internally. Uh, I think I feel better now than I did when I was 18. Did you? That's great. Yeah, I, I think I feel better too now. Now that well, at my 32 years old, <laughs> no, I am, I am, I'm going to be 52 soon. So, uh, but I, I do think that I, um, 
I feel better than when I was 25, definitely. Jose, uh, you have something to add on this? Uh, yeah, I was um, um, trying to comment that in terms of um, advocacy and even political influence, I run um, for the European Parliament as a That's Spanish right. candidate to the European elections in 2019. Uh, you know, that's the largest parliament um, in Europe, certainly, and the, the largest actually in the world competing with the one in India in terms of uh, members of parliament, okay? It is much, much larger than the US Congress. Um, and so I was a candidate and I got uh, 7,000 votes in the election which is not enough to be elected, but uh, I brought the issues uh, for discussion, public discussion. I wanted people to know that aging is a disease. Again, uh, as Maria was saying, it, it might be argue, argued for or against, but I do think it is important for the public sector to realize that aging is the number one risk factor for anything else. Aging is the number That's one fair. risk factor for uh, cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, heart attacks, and almost every disease. So uh, the governments need to know this. Instead of putting lots of money on cancer and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, et cetera, et cetera, which is important, if we can actually fix aging, we basically fix all those other problems. So anyway, that was my attempt to try to do it at the European level uh, as a member of, uh, as a Spanish candidate for the European Parliament. And I got 7,000 votes and it will go down in history. Are you gonna try again? Well, the elections are every five years. I don't know yeah. what will happen in the next three to four years. Things are actually moving very fast, I think, because we should have senolytics and also metformin yeah. approved. Uh, for uh, rejuvenation. So when this happens, I think this is unstoppable. And all yes. parties from right and left, they will uh, have to do it. Because if they don't work on anti-aging, uh, you know, the voters will not vote for them. Yes, absolutely. I wish uh, you were able to run as a candidate in the United States, Jose, because uh, we need people exactly like you with your level of knowledge and dedication to longevity and your passion for expressing these kinds of and ideas. Charisma, right? Mm -hmm. So I Except would say- Charisma is unique. Absolutely. Uh, I would say for people who are either seeking to be candidates for office in the United States or who want to locate some promising individuals uh, who could run for office, uh, they should see Jose as a role model, someone who has run a campaign, uh, someone who has achieved a good result from that, and someone who continues to be very active in advocacy. Yes. Thank, thank you, Jose, you. for all you do. Uh, thanks uh, to you, Maria, and to Gennady and the U.S. Transhumanist Party. We That's should come right. to power. We should come to power the transhumanists. Huh? As I like to say, <laughs> Viva la Revolución! Viva! <laughs> yes, Absolutely. this is a revolution. A revolution. We need to kill death before death kills us. Mm -hmm. It's a life or death struggle, uh, to be sure. Yeah. It is, and as I normally say, we are in between the last mortal generation and the first immortal generation. So you have to decide where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we may be the last generation to die. How sad will that be? Mm -hmm. Now, I also wanted to ask you, Maria, about your aviation experiences since you are a pilot along with uh, your husband, Gary Abramson. So how did you get into that? Yes, I got into that in the same way that I got into a lot of things in my life, which was because I wanted to challenge myself. And I like doing that often. And I think it gives me this little high, you know, that I need um, in my life. Um, so I, 
I was traveling around the world a lot with my singing career, touring a lot, and <clears throat> and then I started feeling scared in airplanes, on airplanes, especially after one bad flight, we went through a really, really terrible storm, and I, I felt uh, I had like a panic attack. So after that, and this was before 9-11, I started asking the, the if I could visit the cockpit, the stewardess, and they, they, they allowed you before to do that. You used to be able to do that in flight. So I would go to the cockpit and hang out with the pilots and, and tell them that, you know, that I get scared when the airplane goes to turbulence and, and they will start explaining to me what exactly happened and what turbulence meant. And, and once, you know, you fear something, the best thing you can do is to get knowledge, right? So the more I learned what everything meant and how the plane was flying and all the principles and the vernules, you know, all, all the stuff that, that makes the aerodynamics of it. And I started studying it and I, I, I realized that I, uh, I was losing my, I started losing my fear. And then and the next time I would get on the plane, I'd be like, okay, that's happened because of this. And they explained this to me. I would go to the cockpit again if I felt fear and immediately the fear would go away when I was in the cockpit with the pilots. And so I said, well, maybe I should just take a few classes and, and that, that, that should help. And uh, of course I was terrified and I, I did my first class. I, I threw up and, and, and I felt horrible. And I, was, I went home and I said, never again. And I went to bed at night feeling bad and, um, and frustrated. And um, next morning I woke up filled with, with this awe sensation of awe and oh my god yesterday I flew an airplane I think I was feeling so sick the whole day before that I couldn't even realize what happened and I was just overtaken by the the, the way I was feeling and I said oh my god I flew I, I, I was flying an airplane and I felt like I needed to go back so I was lucky to find this instructor that was very patient with me so we we were going up 15 minutes at a time or something like that and do like a few pads around the airport. And so I was getting used to it. And um, and I think that by the time I did the, like this five times or so, I was hooked. I just had fear started going away and then I got so into it. And and then I started doing aerobatics and, uh, and I became a pilot. And, and then I bought planes. I owned three airplanes and I had a fly school. And so that was a, a part of my life that I, I, I dedicated a lot of energy into that. Then I sold the planes later when I divorced my, my first husband uh, for liability situation, but I, that I didn't want to be in. But, uh, but yeah, I, <clears throat> I never felt fear again. And it was because I faced the fear and I understood what was going on, you know, information, so important. And so, yeah, so I love aviation. I love space exploration. I'm a big fan, big fan. I follow everything that's happening in, in the space exploration world. And one of my dreams is one day to, you know, fly to go, fly myself if I could, a spaceship. And uh, people ask me, how can you be a pilot and, 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 be, and do all this risky stuff and like all this risky stuff when you're a life extensionist? And I said, well, that's why I want to be a life extensionist. I'm a life extensionist because I want to be able to do all these things that I love so much for much longer time, right? Yes, and there does seem to be uh, a lot of synergy between the life extension and space exploration communities. They're both quite active within the transhumanist movement and the U.S. transhumanist party. And I think this vision of humankind as a multi-planetary species as breaching beyond the earth, reaching beyond our limits is one that does appeal to many transhumanists. So yes. I can definitely see the connection there. And of course, in order to be able to settle on other planets or even thoroughly explore them we need to have much longer lifespans given that Absolutely. going to mars is a multi-year endeavor uh, and it would be many years of rather difficult living conditions if you don't have uh improved biology to exactly. handle that I, I i always say that and 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 how can we get elon musk involved and he he doesn't seem to be into 
life extension from what I've heard, some people who work with him and in, in friends in common. And, and he says that he thinks that, that people should die and get out of the way, you know, which is, I find is terrible because it's like saying, okay, let's, let's stop creating a cure, a cure for cancer, right? And people die. Uh, and, and, and yeah, it just shocks me that, that, that he doesn't understand that, you know, especially like you said, if we want to do space exploration, we need life extension, they, they go together. And, and we could definitely use him, um, his, his, you know, like I said before, mask speed for longevity. Yes, so I'm going to keep insisting, Elon, if you're out there, I'm going to get you, I'm going to find you. And it's interesting too, because Elon Musk is in his early fifties as well. And he doesn't look like the historic 50 year old did either. And yet he made this statement about people getting out of the way. Well, I, I'm sure he wouldn't want to apply that to himself given that he uh, still has so many ideas about how to transform the world, transform technology, transform space exploration, certainly he should want to have many more decades to realize that. I just hope that dawns upon him as he becomes even a little older. Yeah, I hope so. You know, um, Aubrey says that we, what we propose is not, it's not weird enough for him. Uh, so that's why he's, he doesn't sit with us because we've been trying for a while. Even though Aubrey talked to him, I think it was 10 years ago, but it's, it was too long. You know, things were very different back then. Uh, but I think, you know, because he has uh, Neuralink and all these other concepts, maybe the way he's thinking of life extension is more of the, uh, you know, mind uploading kind of thing, right? And not the, the organic biological um, approach that we have of, of fixing the body right now, so maybe. Yes, that may well be. Uh, so Jose does point out Elon Musk is actually 49. He was born on June 28th, 1971, but he's getting toward 50. He will be 50 in uh, just four months. So uh, I think he ought to consider that his ideas aren't getting stale. So why should anybody else's? Why should a chronological age uh, determine some sort of expiration date. Uh, it seems to be uh, perhaps a uh, an outgrowth of a historical mindset that associated old age with frailty or a decay of cognitive capabilities, which doesn't have to be the case if one is youthful biologically. Uh, Brent, you said hopefully Grimes can turn him onto uh, some different perspectives. Uh, so uh, do you have any uh, particular thoughts on that? Sorry, I was trying to read the chat and I got distracted. What, what did you ask me? Uh, I, I was wondering uh, if Brent could elaborate on his comments. Oh yeah, Brent, go ahead. Chat. Yeah, sure. Um, I just, um, I was recently listening to a uh, lengthy interview of Robert Anton Wilson, and he was talking extensively about his friendship with Timothy Leary and their passionate interests in life extension and space exploration and how he, he was talking about how similarly they go hand in hand in those perspectives of the past as well. And uh, I just know that Grimes has definitely got some interesting perspectives and views and, you know, with their music production and it definitely seems you know, pretty psychedelic what she's involved in. So, you know, Timothy Leary, you know, he was very out there for his time. But when you really start diving into some of his ideas, a lot of it does make sense. So. Yeah, so thank you, Brent, for that elaboration. I also wanted to ask you, Maria, about your company, Longevity Bridge, and what it is working on. You founded it uh, several years ago, correct? Um, in 2017, I think we've, we started it. Yeah. Um, well, Longevity Bridge, um, the idea was or is or was or we're not really focusing on it right now because we are focusing on other stuff and the pandemic also was uh, something that made us, you know, it changed everything the way we we're doing it. But um, it was about biomarkers of aging, basically. We, we were very interested in that aspect because we are making all these statements about 
rejuvenation and and um, and for example, a particular example was the NAD um, supplementation and levels of NAD and we all know that when we're young, we have certain levels of NAD and when we get older, the NAD levels go down. And so then we supplement NAD and we raise our levels, um, but there, there is not a way of measuring that for the public to, you know, something accessible to the public. It's only being measured in labs and there's no uh, standard for it. So there's no table, you know, it's, so we decided that it would be great to have a way of of measure, having you know creating a test for everyone to measure their NAD levels because people were supplementing and also because some people were we thought we were overdoing it and it was also dangerous and so we wanted to see it. and we ourselves were doing these patches um, so there were there was all these questions there were all these questions about well you know how much we're raising our levels. And then if we raise them, what does that mean? Like, does it mean really that there is some rejuvenation? The fact that NAD is higher when you're younger in your body, and then, then you're going to make it higher again, does that, what does that mean? Does it mean it's doing anything? So we wanted to create um, all kinds of assays to, to measure things. And uh, everything started when I was at my birthday party talking to Greg Fay and, and, you know, and my husband said, I think we're applying the patch the other way around. I think the way they are saying you have to apply these patches, electrophoresis patches are, it's wrong because the molecule of NAD has a negative, uh, it was a technical conversation and, and then Greg said, yeah, I think you're right. How can we find out? Well, let's create the test. So anyway, so longevity bridge was the idea to create, um, NAD test. We worked really hard. Uh, we we signed up a lot of people and in the study, and we had to use refrigerated centrifuges that we had to rent and send all over the country because NAD levels they they immediately as soon as you draw the blood, NAD starts degrading, so it, it goes away, it disappears. So it's really hard. To, that's why there's no test available yet. It has to be in a control environment. So we did it, we formed the study, IRB approved, and we worked on it for a long time. And then when we were about to uh, get all the results, the pandemic uh, happened, the labs closed down, the lab we were working with um, was only working for the government on developing a vaccine. So it slowed down the whole process, but then we finally, it finally picked up again. We got all, all the samples processed. We got tons of very valuable data. And, but at that point, my husband and I were completely done with it because it was so much work. And we realized that we were so overwhelmed and we were at a point that we needed funding and to keep going with the, with the research. Um, so we sent out all the uh, reports to everyone. And what happened was that Tom Ingolia, I don't know if you know Tom Ingolia, he acquired the study because you know his work is especially on NAD. So we told him we were gonna fold the study and uh, he said, oh, no, no, I wanna continue this. Um, so he, he acquired the study and he's continuing with it with the test. Uh, the website, I think it's called nadtest.com. And you can, you can sign up and you can get your NAD levels measured with the assay that we created with Longevity Bridge, but now through his company that is called um, longevity research. Let me see. I want to give you the. Is right. it longevity diagnostics research? Yes. Yes. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, so that's how that. So that is what came out of longevity bridge, and now Tom is going to continue it, and hopefully, hopefully taking take it to a commercial, uh, commercially available test. Uh, so that's and now we don't know yet what our next uh, project will be. We're looking to different things. Um, yes. But it is excellent that Tom is continuing this valuable work of essentially quantifying the impact of NAD supplementation uh, on people. I really think it is important to have a systematic scientific approach to these kinds of emerging treatments. It's not enough to just say, well, 
this could work, so I'm going to take a bunch of pills uh, that have the substance. Uh, one really does need to have a way of measuring what the appropriate dose is and what the effect yes. of that is going to be. And he's taking it very seriously and doing it in the right way so that we will really learn what NAD is actually doing with our aging, uh, with, you know, with real data, which is who we always so important to have and now we have all the uh, of course methylation clocks that from Harvard and that's so important because we can measure so much so biomarkers of aging are critical to really work on on, on reversing aging yes absolutely so uh best wishes to tom in i did have the fortune of meeting him at Radfest in 2018 and speaking with him briefly. And of course, we saw his presentation at Radfest 2020, uh, which was quite interesting as well. He would be a great guest for you to have here. Yes, indeed. Uh, and I was thinking the same as you were discussing him, actually. Uh, but yes, uh, most definitely. Now, I also wanted to get your thoughts about the impact of the pandemic, especially because, as you pointed out, it disrupted the work of many labs. And when we spoke with Aubrey, he essentially said that many of the operations of the SENS Research Foundation are back up and running now, even yeah. though initially uh, they could uh, only do about a third of their usual activities. Uh, so how has the situation changed since the start of the pandemic? And do you think it would be possible to regain some of the lost time? I think, uh, I'm not sure we, we're going to regain the lost time, but yes, eventually, yes. Uh, things are much better now. Um, you know, everything, I think, I think we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I think that, that the pandemic, as a, the terrible thing that it is in, in all the, the lives that we lost um, and all the suffering, et cetera, uh, had also a, a positive possibly a positive impact in, in, our, in our field and, and in and many other things that, that will be relevant to the advancement of, of the science, what we're doing in the advancement of science in general. Um, I think one thing was that our, our mission to address aging became clearer than ever. Uh, the pandemic helped this because, you know, it opened eyes about how important it is to be um, healthier and more robust when you're old and and and, and also you know people saw more cl clearer than ever how bad aging is for us you know i think the pandemic um has also forced us to to break the past and, and imagine a new world in in just one year um it was like a like a good exercise for people who are usually you know attached to their comfort zone and and you know here we had to make so many changes so i think it's this this uh, pandemic acted like a like a portal that we needed to advance our mission like a gateway between you know one world and the next i think it could help us jump you know make that jump that we needed faster um because a lot of things started moving faster because of it and 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 that makes a change in people's minds. Uh, it could be, this crisis could be a great opportunity um, for all of us working in longevity. Um, I think it, 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 we can use it as a teaching moment. You know, many of the spaces comprised in science and technology, including private and, um, and government agencies have been seriously affected, you know, including our research, like we were saying, but this crisis also open new lines of research, both at government and private levels. And uh, I see you know, that, that that is improving scientific communication, creating new ways for it. For instance, you know, a lot of information is being made available in, 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 on preprint before peer reviewed. Uh, it's getting broken down on like, you know, social media, internet platforms, and sometimes in, in the media before entering formal peer review. So everything's moving faster. Scientists are reviewing, editing, analyzing, publishing manuscripts at record speeds, you know, and in large numbers. Um, so this, I think this 
this all these things are going to become new standards and i hope that they will help enormously our field i think the intense level of communication among scientists is unprecedented and this is great stuff um of course um a response like this is what we need to make our mission happen and and, and our mission is not seen as an, as an emergency like like covid is being seen but um, I don't know. I think in my interaction, at least with startups dedicated to repairing aging and, and founders uh, and funders, uh, apart from the logical, you know, slowdown in the labs, etc. I think uh, so far they haven't. I haven't encountered any hesitation from from either of them. And in fact, I feel that there's more energy building up. Actually, yeah. quite interesting and. This is definitely a hopeful assessment. I agree that there has been an acceleration in uh, a lot of the adoption of technology as well as certain processes that people use to do their work. And I think part of that stems from the widespread adoption of remote work, uh, which yeah. many institutions were reluctant to adopt in the past. So a surprising proportion of major organizations would still function on this basis where you had to be in person with somebody in order to achieve something and yeah. people are realizing now that's not the case also i think people are thinking a lot more about aging now and um people are thinking a lot more about science when it's funny i i find you know friends of mine that never talked about science coming to me and t talking about, you know, what N MR, you know, the, the, how the vaccines work and, and telling me stuff, very technical stuff, you know, they've been learning and reading. And so, yeah, I think it's, I don't know, I think it has a lot of, there's, there's, there's this new synergy created by the pandemic that it's going to be positive for, for us, for our field. Mm -hmm. Yes, I definitely hope so. And I hope we can drive home the point that if it weren't for biological aging, COVID-19 would be a blip on our radar screens. It wouldn't be nearly right. as hazardous as it is. Exactly. So. People are looking at aging differently, I think, now. Mm -hmm. So to everyone watching, if you want to avoid the next devastating pandemic, invest in efforts to reverse biological aging. Uh, because this is the reason why COVID has had such a deadly toll in the world. I really hope that people will pay attention to this. Yes. So now we've come to the point in our salon where we will go around and see if our panelists have any final questions or comments for you, Maria. And then at the end, uh, we will give you a choice between uh, concluding remarks and a musical performance, whichever one uh, you would <laughs> like to uh, do for us. Uh, but first, uh, let us hear from uh, our panelists. Uh, Art Ramon Garcia, please go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, when the brain is removed, how much of the optic nerve is also included with the brain? Uh, does it include the eyes or is it just snipped at the base? Um, would you have that kind of detail? No. Yes, it's, uh, it's just all we keep is the stem and, and the brain and there's no, uh, nothing else, yeah. All right, thank you. All right, uh, now we will proceed to Jose Cordero. Well, I only have uh, good wishes to you, Maria, to all your work, uh, to all your music, to all your ideas, and to the future. So I want you playing later, that, that's all. And much love, much love. And I hope to see you in Spain soon, and in the USA also when I return there. What is your Spain thing, Jose? Transvision is in October 8, 9, 10. And then we have two days of tours, uh, October 11 and 12, to go outside Madrid and to celebrate the Spanish National Day, which is October 12th. It's like July the 4th in the USA. In Spain, we celebrate the discovery of the Americas on October the 12th. 
Wow. You know, I have a Spanish passport and an Argentinian passport and an American passport. I have three passports, but I'm a Spanish citizen too. Beautiful, beautiful. I so love you, Spain. You will celebrate the Spanish National Day, the discovery of the Americas. Ole! <laughs> and you will play and sing and dance, even flamenco, flamenco. Oh, I, I hope I'm vaccinated and, and I have antibodies so I can get on a plane and do that. That's all I can say. I can't wait to, to travel. That's, that's what I miss the most. Yes, if I can get vaccinated by that time, uh, I will be quite happy to travel as well. Uh, now let us go to Brent Elman. Sure, thank you. Uh, Maria, it was great to connect. Really appreciate everything you've been talking about, everything you do. Um, I Just one question that popped in my mind a moment ago uh, regarding NAD is whether or not uh, it could be measured in urine. And the reasoning for my question, just to kind of preface, is because I've taken some interest in uh, like smart toilet devices that analyze all sorts of different things from our urine. And, and I've just wondered, you know, sitting here listening to you, if that would make it easier to do some of this research, if we were to, you know, if people were able to just install something in there. Oh, no, I wish it was that not simple. Not need to go get blood samples and freeze them and send them in. But I know that NAD is related to the blood, so. Yes, I, I, I am right. almost positive. <laughs> I am almost positive that it cannot be measured in urine. And uh, I was not the person in charge of the science in our study because it was great faith. But I am almost positive it's not. And I know that um, what I can tell you is that we were measuring, um, we're measuring plasma and we were measuring whole blood and we were, we had a, a project of measuring intracellularly. And I think, you know, from everything I heard, the best way would be to measure in tissue. Um, and if you could measure in different organs, because apparently maybe you would have different levels in different parts of your body. And so it's, it's really tricky and, but I am, I, I am almost positive. No, if it, I, I have to imagine that if it was that easy, you know, it, it would have been done already, but, but I'm almost sure. No, you can't, you can measure it. In, in your end. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yes, indeed. So, uh, let us now go to Alexandria Black, and she did pose a question in the chat. Uh, she says, David Sinclair's favorite NAD plus precursor is NMN. Mm -hmm. uh, she's wondering if uh, there are any other promising precursors. Is there anything else that you'd like to say on that, Alexandria? Um, go ahead and answer that before I say more. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think M&M &M is a good precursor. I have never used it myself. Uh, I always used uh, NR and, and then NAD in patches. Um, I know there's the, <clears throat> the new company by Nicola Conlum. Um, what's the name? I'm sure you remember it, Gennady, of her company. I think it's Nuchido. Nichido, yeah, I know Nichido, and I know there's a new, um, so when we were running our study, uh, we had 20 participants from the company Neurohacker Collective that makes um, Qualia, and they make it, Eternus, I think it's called, Alexandria, maybe you know, Eternus, I think it's called Eternus, and they uh, through our study, we saw that their supplement raises NAD levels too. And it does not contain either nicotinamide riboside or NMN. It's, it's totally different ingredients, but they do raise uh, NAD. So there's a, a plethora of options, you know, and some people do sublinguals and some people do sprays in the nose and injections and, and all kinds of things um, to raise NAD. But I think the most critical thing is to find out first, can we measure it and see what it does, whatever we're doing, how much it raises our levels, how much they last, you know, what the decay rate is. And, and then what does that mean? When we, what, what other things around are changing. So we should measure tons of things around that, and not just NAD. And, and we were measuring, we measured 21 metabolites from the NAD metabolome. So 
we not only measure NAD, we measure NADH, uh, in a, you know, a whole list uh, that I, I won't remember, including NR and including NMN and, um, and nicotinamide by itself. And yeah, and, and then we need to understand what it means when you raise NAD, what other things change around. In fact, there are some ideas that we would be able to measure maybe other things around instead of measuring just NAD, and that would be more useful. So Tom is working on all that, and we'll hopefully have more data soon. I think it was, uh, it might have been Aubrey last week, sorry to have missed that one, but was speaking about the crosstalk between different pathways and how we ever understand the complexity of what's really going on there. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's exactly the point, right? There's we cannot determine what's going on by measuring one level of one thing, and uh, it's it's a lot more complex. So hopefully, we'll have more information soon. I'm delighted to meet you, Maria, and I would like a little mentoring because I think we're sort of doing about the same thing me being a uh, director of community resilience. In a way, we, we have a bit of overlap in what we're trying to do, so I'm sure I could pick up some tips from you. Thank well, you, you so much for joining us. Call me anytime. Do you have my email address? We are oh, Facebook friended, I'm pretty sure. We can go from there. Anytime we can chat, have a one-on-one, -on -one, and I'll be glad to share with you my experience and thank anything you. that helps. Thanks nice so much for joining. Of course, thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Maria. And now the time has come for you to decide. Uh, do you want to give a concluding speech or a meta or a musical performance for us? Okay, so I would like to try musical performance. It doesn't mean it's going to be successful. You guys have to imagine that you are in my in my dining room where my piano is and I'm just practicing and you're my guests and you're my friends and I'm sharing a moment of practice with you because as I said, I never accompanied myself before and I'm just starting to learn. So I play basic chords, but, but yeah, I would like to, to try a little song for you. Excellent. Well, we look forward <coughs> to hearing it. <coughs> didn't warm up my voice. I'm going to get some water and we're going to do this. Yes, indeed. So we will have a live streamed musical performance for you very shortly. So well, that's my piano. <clears throat> Can you see? Oh, I'm going to take this off actually. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Don't pay attention to wrong notes, all right? <clears throat> they don't count, just the right ones. <clears throat> this is a, a song called Nature Boy. That um, the version that I I listened to all my life was by Nat King Cole. <clears throat> There was a boy, a very strange enchanted boy. They said he wandered very far.
Quite impressive. Bravo. <laughs> Very well done. Yes, indeed. And you know, this is very much in the spirit of the Enlightenment salons. The original 18th century Enlightenment salons would take place in uh, living rooms, uh, kind of similar to your own. And there would be musical performances along with philosophical conversations. So we are doing what we can to replicate the spirit of those gatherings and just modernize them, take them into the 21st century. So thank you very much for uh, doing that. And uh, our audience was quite uh, pleased as well. Uh, they remarked at how beautiful your voice is, of course. I, I think you're the best singer in our movement. Uh, so. <laughs> Oh my God, that means so much. Thanks for giving me the space and the opportunity to sing right now. Thank you, I really appreciate it. It's the first time I, I play and accompany myself for, for an audience, first time. So to you, thank you. Wonderful. All right, thank yes. you everybody. We'll see you soon. Are we, are we done or anything else? Well, we say goodbye? The standard farewell is our Vulcan sign to live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Thank you.